Hello and welcome to this webinar on conversational copywriting with Nick Osborne. Um, I'm super excited to bring Nick to you all today. Uh, we just had a podcast episode with Nick uh, about conversational copywriting for course creators. Uh, we talked about some of the stuff you'll hear about in this webinar. Uh, there's a link in the chat if you want to go check out that episode if you have not um, seen it yet. Uh, I'd like to just again welcome everybody to the call. Ali, Bob, Dennis, Dirk, Don, Gail, Harry, John, Jonas, Jorge, Lee, Mark, Nelly, Rahul, Tonya, Via, Vincent. For those of you watching in Facebook land, welcome to the call. If you're watching the replay, I'm glad you're taking time out of your day to check this out. Uh, if I were to pick one skill as somebody who's not classically trained in uh, business or marketing, my background's in anthropology, the number one like kind of meta skill to rule them all is copywriting. It's something that I've always been interested in. It's, you know, a part of communication and conversation, but, you know, really looking at words and how to communicate better and how to sell with words and how to add value with words. It's really the ultimate skill. Everything else is kind of downstream from that. That's my opinion. Um, I'm super excited to bring Nick to you all today. Uh, we are going to be doing four giveaways in this call. Uh, we're going to save that till the end. So if you want to participate and be eligible for the giveaway, you need to be on the live call over here in Zoom. If you're watching this on Facebook and you want to jump over here into the Zoom webinar, uh, there's a link to follow where you can register real quick and jump in. Um, if you just want to hang out on Facebook, that's cool. We'll also take questions from over there. If you are um, here on Zoom, uh, there's going to be an opportunity for questions. So we encourage you to ask lots of questions. There's a Q&A feature here on Zoom where you can type your question in. Um, I'll kind of MC the questions when we get into that uh, part of the presentation at the end. You can also post your questions in the chat. And also here in Zoom, there's an ability to raise your hand. There's a little button down there where you can raise your hand and go live. And uh, we can have a live conversation with you, which is really relevant here to this, the, the topic here on conversational <laughs> copywriting. Um, so that's it. Uh, welcome to the call, Nick. I'm super excited to, to do a, a training with you with the course creation community. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, well, you're very welcome. Uh, hey, you know, I'm happy to. And uh, you've, been a, you've been a good buddy to me. We haven't known each other for a long time, but I'm really happy to be here. And, and also, as we get into this, you'll see, I, I kind of have a, I, I feel a natural affinity to the people who work with you. Because, of course, I'm a course creator as well. So we're all, we're, we're all kind of trying to do the same thing here. So I'm going to talk about conversational copywriting. Like, like Chris said, this is kind of a meta skill. It's a basic core skill for any marketing and any, anything you do. Actually, it's a core skill anywhere. It's a core skill at home when you're trying to persuade your kids to tidy their bedrooms or whatever. You know, we're, our whole lives are about kind of selling in a way, trying to persuade and, and trying to get people to do the stuff we want to do, like which movie should we go to this evening, stuff like that. So persuasion is central to everything in our lives and it's absolutely essential to any kind of marketing. So I modestly call conversational copywriting the future of selling online. Um, I actually believe that to be true, and over the course of this presentation, hopefully, uh, you'll end up agreeing with me, because I absolutely believe this to be the case. So, I'm just going to move the slide along, if I can get that to work. Yeah, sorry. Whoops, and I'm, I'm already messing up. <laughs> All right, for some reason. So, what is conversational copywriting? A, it's a more open, transparent, and engaging approach to copywriting online. There is a, and we'll get into this, that there's a, you know, I've, to give you some context, I've been doing this for 38, 39 years now. I've been earning my living as a copywriter. So I was a copywriter way before the web came along, and I've seen all kinds of different styles and approaches. I, I've been a print copywriter. I've been a direct mail copywriter. I've been an online copywriter. 
And a lot of that old school approach is, is kind of pushy. It's kind of harsh. And I don't think it's a great fit for the online space. So conversational copywriting, what is it? It's, it's the picture on the left. I mean, it's not the picture on the left. It's the one on the right. And in fact, I could probably just go off and have, make myself a cup of coffee now because if a picture's worth a thousand words, which is kind of odd for a copywriter to say, but these two images really do sum up the difference between, uh, you know, hard charging, direct response, pushy copywriting with the guy with the megaphone and the quiet, respectful, you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many conversation you see on the right two totally different ways of communicating. Often they could both be persuading the people on the right. One could be saying, hey, let's go to such and such a place for lunch and somebody, the other person saying, no, let's go to this other place. So they can still be in a situation where they are trying to change someone's mind, but it's a much more respectful, it's a much quieter uh, tone in terms of persuasion. So why bother? Because you know, if you want to build an open and trusting and lasting relationship with your prospects and customers, you can't get there by shouting at them. And I think this is particularly true in our case. I, I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, about how we're kind of all in the same boat. We're course creators. We are, you know, if, if you're selling courses, if you have a membership site, if you're combining them both, hey, we're all of us on this call. We're teachers. And so when we try to get someone to sign up or subscribe or become a member, we, are, we then have to interact with those people, right? It's, it's not like we're selling shoes or a lawnmower where it's kind of an, an anonymous transaction. If I sell you a lawnmower, you don't know who I am. If I'm selling you shoes, you don't know the person who made the shoes. It's just a, an item. So I can actually be a bit more rough and brutal selling you that kind of stuff because I never have to look you in the eye after I've sold it to you. If, I'm, if I become your teacher, if we're, if we're course creators, if we're going to host a membership, if like Chris, you are totally there, look, there he is. He's there. He sold you stuff and he's there. He's totally accountable. So. If he'd started off trying to sell to you in like a really kind of pushy, obnoxious way, what, what kind of start to the relationship is that? It's not a good start at all. So that's why I think like for us and for a lot of online business, the conversational approach is the best approach because we have to, you know, I, I don't want people to have buyer's remorse. I don't want people to have second thoughts if they, you know, enroll or subscribe to something that I'm selling. So just so that you understand what I'm talking about when it comes to conversational copywriting, I want to kick in with some examples. So I'm during the course of this presentation, there's going to be examples. I'm going to give you some background on kind of why now and why it works. And then some more examples. I mean, I want you to leave this presentation with some skills so that you can actually start making a change right away. You can start, you know, just, just playing around with stuff and saying, huh, huh, maybe I can shift that perspective a bit. Maybe I can shift the kind of my mindset a little bit as a copywriter, as a sales writer. So some examples, if you want to be a conversational copywriter, be inclusive. So here's a, here's a email or part of an email from Jeff Walker, who you may have heard of from the product launch formula. So I think, I think Jeff is a tremendous, copywriter. He's absolutely, he may not describe himself this way, but I would say absolutely. He's a conversational copywriter and one of the best. So here's, here's part of his email. I don't know about you, but I never have been very comfortable with selling. When I was in the Boy Scouts, I only sold two bags of donuts for our fundraiser, one to my parents and one to our next door neighbors. I mean, how hard is it to sell donuts? I'm not sure why I always felt squeamish about sales, but I know I'm not the only one. There are a lot of people who have trouble selling. Now, he's actually a consummate marketer, a marketer, a consummate copywriter and seller, but he's not treating, he's not speaking at you. He's actually engaging with you. He's being very inclusive. Just that first few words, I don't know about you. He, he's inviting you to be part of this. He's including you. He's saying, you know what? I'm not so very different from you. I, I, selling doesn't come naturally to me. And, and I'm exactly the same. I have a very similar story. When I was uh, in my misspent youth in my late teenage years, I went and uh, lived in Turkey 
for a year. It was a different place back then. And I lived in this small community and I made my living, or I was meant to make my living, uh, working in a carpet shop, uh, helping the locals sell carpets to passing tourists. Uh, over the course of a year, I helped sell one carpet. Like in terms of face-to-face -face salesman, I'm pathetic, I'm useless, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like Jeff Walker. But just the tone of the way he writes here, you don't feel you're being sold out. You just feel like a friend is talking to you and empathizing with you. So be transparent. This is a, an email, part of an email from a fellow called Drayton Bird. Now, I show off and say, hey, I've been doing this for 39 years. Drayton has been a copywriter, a professional copywriter for over 50 years. And he can drink you under the table. And he's, he's like got more energy now than most copywriters, more energy and enthusiasm now than most copywriters half his age. So, so, but he's super, super transparent. So he says, earlier today, I said on LinkedIn that if you were one of my 5,019 connections, I'd give you a free gift as a thank you. Uh, so he's now offering this free, um, this free download. And then he says, I don't know if it happens to you all right. Again, he's doing what Jeff Walker is doing. He's, he's including you in this. I don't know if it just happens to you, but when I connect with people, many immediately try to sell me something, like on, on LinkedIn. This is A, bloody irritating, and B, a damn hard, stupid way to sell. What's he doing there? He, he's not being formal. He's not being a formal copywriter. He's using a slightly off-color language, which again suggests that he's actually talking to you one-on-one -on -one as a person. Anyway, then he says, so I'm going to try to do what good salespeople do. First, get to know people, then figure out what you want and need. Maybe my book will give you a laugh, but I hope it will inspire you to do better. Download it right here. So he's being kind of transparent. He's saying, look, here's how the sales process goes. Here's how people do it badly. They're trying to sell you stuff. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you something free so we get to know each other. And then I'm going to sell you stuff. He, he's, like, so he, he's, he's like the magician who's telling you how the magic is done. And when he does that, it's incredibly disarming. He's saying, look, here, here's what I'm going to do. Here's, I, you know, I, I'm not going to sell you something off the bat. I'm going to give you something free. And then I'm going to sell you something afterwards. There's something very disarming about being transparent and honest. And it's very kind of contrary to the old school direct response copywriting approach. Uh, but it works. I mean, Drayton, his, he's made, I don't know how much money for his clients over the years. He is an outstanding copywriter. Uh, try some imaginary dialogue. So we have a question. Want more sales in the next 30 minutes? Hey, I'm not going to be reading all the slides. I just want to, I just like these examples. In October, we introduced the Sumo Partnership Program to the world, and a few partners have crushed it. We've seen firsthand their crazy effective tactics to make more sales. You see this kind of casual language. Uh, wouldn't it be nice for us to show you what they're doing? Why, yes. Yes, it would. So we're sharing some epic lessons. So th those words, why yes, yes, it would be. That's, that's like the reader's answer. It's like the writer is both the writer and including. So it's like, wouldn't it be nice to show you what they're doing? Why yes, yes, it would. Thank you very much. Yes, please. It's like there's almost a conversation happening there implicitly. So again, all of these writers are kind of including the reader. They're not just writing at the reader. They're not reading off the brief and saying, what are the five key benefits we have to push at the reader? They're trying to engage the reader. They're trying to make the reader feel they're part of this, part of a conversation. And another way of doing this is using everyday language. So Angel's Cup, this is a uh, coffee subscription service. You pay a monthly subscription and coffee is delivered to your door. This is run by a young couple. I know them a little bit. And their audience are, are kind of millennials, maybe even younger than millennials, just you know, not, not stuffy old people like me anyway. So instead of saying subscribe to our super duper um, coffee subscription service. They're saying become a coffee hunter. That sounds more interesting. Uh, then underneath, crazy variety, awesome roasters, blind tastings, and an active community. So community, hey, there's people talking about this stuff. And they're using language, like everyday language, like crazy variety and awesome roasters. They're not using the usual language of this business, which is all about our small batch roasting machines and our artisanal, you know, there's, there's all this kind of blah, blah, blah and nonsense that coffee roasters talk about. 
And so they're, they're, they're taking a completely different approach. And they see the button at the bottom, skip the pitch and join now. I love that. I love that. Skip the pitch. In other words, scroll down and we're going to go through the whole kind of sales spiel. <laughs> but if you want to skip the pitch and just subscribe and join us, and it's not, it's not buy now, it's not subscribe now, it's join now, it's join us, sense of community. But like I say, the key there is the use of everyday language. Create a, a pause. So Again, we're looking on the left there. This is again, Jeff Walker's product launch formula. This, it, they open their doors two or three times a year. And if you go to the website when they're not doing the course, the program, then they say, hey, sorry, it's closed, but join the notification list. It used to be on the notification list that you would click on that and you go straight to a form where you put in your name and email address. They've changed that. They've now inserted that part on the right which is basically a three simple questions or statements. I'm just starting out, I've got an online business or I've got an offline business. And, and this, is, this is kind of fueled by that line at the bottom, the Ryan Levesque's ask method, where instead of just signing them up during the sign up process, you ask them a question like, hey, just tell us something about yourself so that we can speak directly to you and to your needs. Now, there's a big advantage here to the marketer because the marketer gets to create segments and send them more relevant stuff. But there's also something else happening, which is that the marketer is saying, hang on, we're not just gonna stuff you in a pipeline. We wanna stop, you know, you tell us. It's conversational, you tell us where you're at, what kind of information you need, what would be most valuable to you. There's kind of, this is, the opposite of old school marketing, where we would push at an audience and say, hey, buy this for these five reasons and do it now. Uh, now we're saying, hey, what is it that you want to hear about? What is it you want to learn? What is it you need to have? And let's see if we can help you with that. Totally different mindset. Conversational copywriting is also a, life, it's a cure for lifeless descriptive text and kind of corporate gobbledygook. So on the left, so, so these in fact are examples of, uh, on the left is, isn't it? partial example of, of one of the homework assignments I set in my course on conversational copywriting. And this is text I've taken from a website. The Tenko Place Family Resorts, all inclusive family vacations, give you a top family vacation with your kids and time to reconnect as a couple too. It's a horrible long sentence. Nobody talks like that. It feels clumsy when you read it out loud. And there is no I don't know, it's just descriptive. It's just describing something. You don't feel anything when you read that. It doesn't feel like a person said it. Anyway, on the right there is one of the students. Again, this is part of what one of the students wrote. Uh, overheard at the Tenko Place Family Resort. This kid stuff is, aw is awesome. I bet mum and dad are bored. All right, just, a, just this, whoever, I can't remember her name, but when she wrote that, like this is such a beautiful antidote to boring description. She turned it around. Normally we'd have, if you were gonna look at a family speaking, the spokesperson would normally be a parent, you know, enjoying dinner and saying, oh, I hope the kids are okay. She turned it around and said, hey, let's do this through the kids' point of view, is the kids are having a great time. And they, perhaps scientifically, are worried about whether mom and dad are having a good time too. So all of a sudden, now you smile, you laugh, totally different way, way better than that kind of traditional, boring, descriptive approach. So th that's just a taste. And I'm going to go into more how to towards the end. I just want to get you give you a feel for the difference between traditional in your face, kind of blunt trauma <laughs> copywriting, where you're trying to push and persuade and change people's minds and make them buy. And this more engaging conversational tone where you're actually trying to I don't know, get off on the right foot, establish a relationship that is respectful uh, and mutually, you know, has mutual value to both of you right from the, right from the get go. And that means speaking in a different way. It means selling in a different way. So why now? Uh, again, so we got our little friends, those images again, because the web isn't a broadcast medium. Like I said, at the outset, I, you know, I, I, I was a copywriter for 15, 20 years before the web came along. So I'm used to writing for broadcast media like TV and radio and print. And in those days, yeah, I'd have to write at the audience. You know, when you're watching TV, you can't, you can't talk back to the TV. You can't create 
uh, TV programming in response. You can on YouTube, but you can't with regular TV or regular radio or regular print. They're one way broadcast media. And yeah, we had to kind of shout because we were always interrupting. We were interrupting a, a TV show or a radio program or someone's enjoyment of a magazine. An advertisement it was always an interruption. So we had to raise our voice to be heard. Online, it's not the case. The web is not a broadcast medium. It never has been. It's a, it's a one to, you know, it's, it's a two way medium or a multi way medium where people engage, where the audience gets to speak as well as the, I mean, in fact, if you include Facebook, regular people publish more stuff on the web than companies and media companies do. That this medium is more about the user. It's more controlled by the user, by us, than it is by companies, uh, you know, agents and, and big media companies like the New York Times or whatever. Totally different, totally different. And, and, and by definition, the web is both social and conversational and it's getting more and more so. I mean, I, I think the web was social and conversational back in the late 1990s when I got involved with it. But now with the rise of social media, with the rise of mobile media, it is absolutely social and conversational. It's the nature of the medium. So yes, old school copywriting used to be the way to go in the days of old school media, one way broadcast media. But you can't take that and expect to succeed and apply it to a medium that is intrinsically social and conversational, like the web, like social media, like mobile. You, you've got to follow in step with what the experience that consumers are enjoying online. You have to speak to them in the way they used to, that, that is natural for the web, that is natural across social media and social channels. So that, that's kind of why now, on top of that, Hey, like I said, our, our audience, <laughs> they have power over us now. They can shut us out any time they like. Uh, the Adblocker Plus, I think that's been installed over 100 million times. I think Adblockers have been, software extensions have been uh, installed on, I, I was reading the other day, over 640 million devices and growing. So if people don't like our blah, 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 the noise we make with our ads, they can just block us. Hey, on, on, in, on the right, in your email, you can you get a Gmail, go to any other email provider. Uh, like Gmail, they have a whole separate area where they shunt all the promotional emails now. As a user, you can mark something as spam. You can filter stuff out. You can unsubscribe with a click. Our, our audience has enormous power. So if you raise your voice too much as a, as a marketer, if you shout too much, if you push too often, if you become a bore instead of a source of information or entertainment, you know, if you're no longer welcome, it is so, it is super easy now for people to just block you out, unsubscribe you and stop paying attention. So that's why, that's why now is the time to move from old school copywriting to conversational copying. And that's also why people say to me sometimes, oh yeah, but conversational copywriting just sounds like a, I don't know, like second best. It's like the soft approach. It's the candy floss of copywriting. Uh, to which I reply, that's absolute bullshit. Conversational copywriting is far more powerful online. Offline, not so much. To, you know, in TV, radio, print, not so much. Online, conversational copywriting is way more powerful than traditional copywriting. Absolutely not second best or second choice. Absolutely not some kind of fluffy candy floss version of copywriting. I know the difference. I've done it. I've done both approaches. Uh, I've been involved in thousands, hundreds of thousands of tests. You know, I know what works and what doesn't work. And online, a more conversational approach will help you. So why, how is the conversational approach different and better? So I, I mean, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing, I'm hoping that as, as course creators, that you are by and large nodding your heads and saying, hey, this feels right. This feels, yeah, just, just, just naturally what Nick's saying makes sense. I'm hoping, I'm hoping you're feeling that. Uh, but even if you're not, the, the, the science behind this, there's evidence behind this. So I just want to go through this quickly, just in case you have to persuade yourself or persuade a partner or persuade a client or a colleague or a supplier. If you ever have to kind of persuade someone beyond, well, it's kind of self-evident. If you have to go further than that, uh, that's what these few slides are for. So th there's a pathway here. We start with conversational copywriting. 
which leads to emotional engagement. You're engaging your, your reader, your audience. That builds trust and loyalty. And trust and loyalty leads to increased sales. Uh, so let's see how that works. Uh, going back again to our friends here of the shouting at someone or in conversation with someone. There's a wonderful book, Conversational Intelligence uh, by Judith Glazer. And she does, uh, she's done a lot of research into this. Uh, and with MRI machines, those are those big machines in hospitals that you kind of slide yourself in and they can, they do imaging of what's going on in your brain. They can see which part of your brain is firing up. So it turns out that if you, let's say if you're, if, Hey, if, if, if I'm walking in the park and some mad dog comes running at me, I have that fight or flight response, right? That's when the amygdala, that little part, that very old part in my brain fires up and says, oh my goodness, you better run. There's a dog coming at you. So it's been around for as long as humans have been around the fight or flight or, or freeze um, reaction to, to danger. It turns out that if you actually shout at someone or if you even are pushy, if you sell, if, 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 if I sell it to you the same way a used car salesman might sell it to you or someone knocking on your door might sell it to you, if, if I'm too pushy, too much in your face as a salesperson, your amygdala actually fires up like, you know, like the 4th of July. It's the same as if you suddenly were a cave person and you saw a saber-toothed tiger. Your, your brain responds in the same way. As soon as your amygdala fires up, it creates these defensive filters. You stop listening to that salesperson. This is, this is like data that we never had before the invention of the MRI machine. But now we know, we know that in conversation and, and not just selling, if, an, if a conversation gets loud or aggressive, uh, the same thing happens up. So it happens, the amygdala becomes very active in the brain, filters are put up, people stop listening and looking for ways to leave. On the right, if you have a quiet, gentle, or respectful conversation with someone, something very different happens. The amygdala stays quiet. And the prefrontal cortex, which is at the front here, uh, begins to light up. And, and this is a, our most recent part of our brain. It's where we make kind of executive decisions. We make choices. A lot of our emotional choices and decisions and feelings are, are processed in the prefrontal cortex. So now you're far more likely to actually be able to get through to someone, to have someone listen to you. If you make sure that you don't stimulate the amygdala, but you do stimulate the prefrontal cortex and it gets even better. If I'm in conversation uh, with Chris and I'm trying to sell him something and I'm respectful and, and this is all about our prefrontal cortex, our amygdala is very sleepy. I, I get almost like a free pass. If I actually want to sell him something, I can be a little bit pushy which outside of that conversational context, if I did it out of the blue, would cause his amygdala to light up. But if I've prefaced that with respectful conversation and listening, and he feels that I'm empathetic and that I'm respectful of him, I'm actually get a little free pass now to sell him a bit. And the prefrontal cortex will say to the amygdala, hey, I got this, it's okay, stay asleep. So I, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing that. If you really want to get into that, if you, if you want to dig in, get this book. It's, it's really fascinating. So that is, that's how you get from, that's how conversational leads to engagement. And now I'm really engaging with someone. So is, is there a correlation between that kind of engagement or emotional engagement to trust and loyalty in sales? Yes, there is. So some research on the left here, 70% of consumers with high emotional engagement will spend twice as much with the brands they like. Twice as much, 70% will spend twice as much if they feel emotionally engaged with that business. On the right, when they feel emotionally connected, 81% of consumers, and we're not talking about like 10 or 20, like 81% of consumers will promote a brand to friends and family. This is, this is the power of conversational copywriting, is the ability to connect with people emotionally, engage with them emotionally, and then drive this kind of change in, in the response of people it, it is massively powerful. So now we're gonna go from trust and loyalty, that engagement to trust and loyalty, and we're gonna see does that impact sales. There's actually, a, there's a ton of data on this, a ton of research that 
put together by e-commerce companies. But I really like this quote from Neil Fitzgerald. He's the former chairman and CEO of Unilever, a massive multinational company. You can have all the facts and figures, all the supporting evidence, all the endorsements that you want. But if at the end of the day, you don't command trust, you won't get anywhere. And that's true, eh? I mean, if you don't trust a company, you're going to do business with them. If you don't trust somebody selling you whatever, a course, if, if something about their language is off, if something about their approach is off, are you going to buy from them? I don't think so. We don't like to buy from people we don't trust. So now we get back to why conversational copywriting is that when you look at this, conversational copywriting to emotional engagement, to trust and loyalty, to increase sales, you cannot get to emotional engagement with the usual hard charging approach to copywriting, you know, with the BS, with the hype by shouting. You can't do that. The, the only emotion that you'll stimulate that way is anger <laughs> and people being pissed off with you. If you want to engage with people in a way that actually is a positive emotional engagement, you have to do it, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex way. And the way you do that is with the conversational approach to copywriting rather than the traditional hard charging approach. So how, how do we do this? How do you actually get into this? How do you get started with this? So first off, you got to listen. Hey, a, a conversation is a two way thing. You can't just have a conversation by talking at someone. So if you want to be just conversational in your style, in your approach, in your mindset, the first thing you have to understand is, is who am I talking to? Who, who are these people? Who, who's my audience? So how do we do that? Well, we're spoiled online. There are so many ways to figure out who your audience is and what they care about. Hey, do polls and surveys. I do them. I'm sure Chris does them all the time. Ask people. You know, what, what's important to you? What are your preferences? What do you think? What do you worry about? What do you want? What are you looking for? Ask. It's so easy online. You can do it on Facebook. You can do it through tools like SurveyMonkey. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So go to social media. Actually engage on social media. Uh, most social media, most companies do a terrible job with social media because they treat social media as an old school broadcast medium. They're always promoting them their staff, but they never actually actively look for feedback from their followers or friends and they never respond. But if you do, if you use social media in a social way and you actually get into conversation with people who engage with you through social media, it's amazing what you can learn. You can learn about, again, what people care about, but, but also one of the things I do as a copywriter, as a craftsperson with words, is I listen to the language people use in social media. This is the language of my prospective customers. I, I want to listen to how they talk about stuff, the words they use, the phrases they use, the priorities they have, uh, the things they love, the things they want, the things they stop, wish companies would stop doing. If you listen through social media, incredibly powerful. On the right, reviews. Often, if I want to understand about something, I will go to a related product on Amazon. Uh, I'll ignore all the company, the vendors, blah, blah, blah. I'll scroll straight down to uh, the customer reviews. I'll ignore the five-star reviews because that's the fanboy stuff. I'll ignore the one-star reviews because these are people who are usually just by nature pissed off with everything. And I'll look at the reviews, particularly the, the kind of four, the four-star reviews. In other words, people who like it, but with perhaps one little niggle. And again, I, you know, what do people think? If this is my audience, who are they? How are they talking? What do they love? What do they, what do they hate? It's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to actually listen. And that allows you then to engage them in a conversational way where they recognize your voice as being, hey, you're someone like them. You, you talk the way they talk. You use the language and phrases they use. Next, once you've done your listening, you've got to find your conversational voice for your company. So on the left there, we have, hey, often it's the, conversa it's, it's the voice of the founder. So the conversational voice of Lifter LMS is Chris's voice. And he, he uses that very well. I mean, not in a manipulative way, but just by being there, his, his voice by nature as, as a co-founder has become the voice and character of that business. Sometimes with Apple, a company can get incredibly large and still the founder's voice is the voice of that company. 
in the middle there, a company will sometimes outsource its voice. So William Shatner becomes the voice of Priceline.com and it worked very well for them. Uh, I like, quite often I'll see really interesting uses of voice again on, on social media. Uh, on the top, the top right, if you're, if you're from the UK, uh, welcome, that's where I was born and raised. Uh, if you're in the UK, you'll probably recognize a brand of drink called Innocent Drinks. And they're always lighthearted, slightly frivolous, always kind of being playful. And they sent out this, uh, this tweet, just like a few, is it a tweet or a Facebook? I can't even see. Uh, just a few days after, Chris, after Easter, or maybe it was the day after, saying congratulations to the 14 people in the UK who still have some Easter egg left. It's just playful. It's just that they're just playing around. And it's, and it's their voice. It's their character. The one underneath, Old Spice, uh, tell your armpits to stop crying like a baby <laughs> with Old Spice sweat defense. Now, Old Spice used to be a really kind of old man brand. And then they did that ad that I think most people saw on YouTube several years ago now with the, the kind of buff guy in the shower who's then suddenly standing on a boat and then suddenly he's sitting on a horse and then diamonds are falling into his hand. Do you remember that YouTube video for Old Spice? And that transformed that brand from old school to younger generation. And part of that brand was, again, is it's kind of not so formal. And so this voice, tell your armpits to stop crying like a baby. The old brand could never have said that. It, wasn't, it wouldn't have fit with their voice at all. It would have been incongruent. But the new brand, absolutely it fits. And it reinforces that brand, that this is a kind of younger person, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> all, you know, sweat defense deodorant. So you gotta, you, you, before you settle on your voice, you want to listen. And then one way or another, and for companies, hey, businesses of our size, very often it's our voice. It's the voice of the founder or, or the kind of front person. But larger companies will look for different ways to find that voice and then start applying it. So, so people say to me, oh, my goodness, uh, you know, I've had students talking to their clients about conversational copywriting. And they say, Nick, do I really tell my client to just rewrite the whole website, everything all at once? And I say, no, no, it would make no sense. I wouldn't trust you if you told me to do that. But you can start dipping your toe in the water. And, and two areas where you can do that are through email and social media, because email really is kind of one on one. It's like it certainly used to be or it still has the potential to be uh, writing to someone in their personal inbox. Uh, you're not bringing them yet to your place, which is your website. You're talking to them in their place, which is their email inbox. And it's a great place then to test your conversational voice, to test your voice. Does this resonate? Do they feel comfortable with this? Do they feel that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm their kind of person? Another place, of course, that is an absolute natural for testing a voice is social media, because again, totally social, totally conversational by, by definition, by its very nature. So yeah, play around in social media, see if people respond to your voice, respond to the way that you talk. It's, it's kind of interesting because Chris, when you, when you put up that, um, I think it was on Facebook about our, the podcast interview and mm -hmm. you talked about, what was it? Copywriting, not treat, what was it? Not, uh, without being a scumbag, without being a scumbag. All right. So, <laughs> uh, I, I shared that on my private Facebook group with my students and their response was, they just loved it. The whole scumbag thing because we were speaking their language. They was like, yeah, that's how we feel. That's how we feel. And that's what you're after. You're, you're looking for a voice. You're looking for a way of speaking. Uh, you're looking for language that makes people think, hey, that's how we feel. We love that. We love that you put it that way. We love that you use that phrase, that you said it that way. Uh, so that's, that's the next step. So now we're going to do some warm-up exercises for getting conversational. So here's, an, I guess this is the tips and tricks section because everyone likes the tips and tricks, the how-to. So let's just get to, we're going to get into a few specifics, a few ways you can work on this. Very, very powerful. Ask open-ended questions. So, so what do I mean by that? So on the left, there's a couple of examples of closed questions. Do you like peanut butter? The answer is yes or no. Uh, do you like your peanut butter smooth or crunchy? The answer is either smooth or it's crunchy. It's closed because the conversation is done. So if I wrote a blog post or a social media update and it said, do you like peanut butter? Uh, and you in your mind just said, yes, I do. 
would you carry on reading? No, why would you? There's not, you, we're done. I asked a question, you answered the question and we're done. On the right, it's an open-ended question. Of these seven popular recipes that include peanut butter, which is your favorite? Well, hang on. I guess I better read the article now or look at the slideshow or watch the video to see what these recipes are. And I'm kind of intrigued because I do have a favorite recipe that includes peanut butter. And I wonder whether you're gonna include that as one of your seven. So that's an open-ended question. That invites the, the, the reader to keep moving forward, to keep, you know, to explore deeper into your content, into your page. And it's also an open-ended question is including your reader. It's, it's engaging your reader. And again, this is part of the process of being more conversational. Mirror the language of your audience. This is a total absolute ninja trick, which I actually learned from this guy. Uh, Chris Voss is the author of Never Split the Difference. So Chris Voss, he, he used to be the number one hostage negotiator for the FBI. Oh, look, you got it too. Good for you. Fantastic book. So he, he, was, he was the number one hostage negotiator for the FBI. He used to do terrorist negotiations, um, bank robbers, like all the, all the really tough stuff that get Chris and his team. And he used to start off old school of saying, oh, what, what will it take to get you out of there? And anyway, he, he, he totally transformed the way negotiations were done. And honestly, uh, it, it's like he could, he, he, he could call that conversational negotiations. <laughs> Because that's what he was into, is how do I engage with the terrorist, with the bank robber? How do I form an emotional connection with that person so that they, they care? About it? It, it, it was like when I was reading through that book, I was just nodding and nodding and nodding. And one of the things he talks about is mirroring the language of the hostage taker. And he said, this is just like a ridiculously powerful kind of ninja mind trick. So if I, if I was selling uh, coffee makers online and I saw on Twitter that I, or across social media or everywhere that a lot of people were saying, I wish I could find a plastics free coffee maker. And I thought, huh, I think I'll make and sell one of those. And now I'm going to sell it and I need a headline for my sales page for this plastics free coffee maker. And my headline is going to be, have you ever wished you could find a plastics free coffee maker? In other words, I'm just repeating back what people are saying. This is. Which is different from say hello to the coffee maker 5000. That's right. The coffee maker of the future or save yeah. the fishies or wh whatever it's going to be. Um, and, and it's kind of, it's kind of difficult for a copywriter because as a professional trained copywriter, it's my job to be clever. It's, you know, I meant to come up with something that's clever. It's my job as a copywriter. If I just repeat what people say, where's the skill in that as a copywriter? So you actually have to kind of swallow your pride if you want to use this as a, as a kind of mind trick. But he was saying in, in hostage negotiation, it's massively powerful in terms of holding people's attention. It's just mirroring their language, repeating. And in fact, if you're negotiating for a pay rise, if whatever you're, neg you're negotiating the price on a new, uh, on a new or used car, uh, try, the, try this. Try just mirroring the language of the person in front of you. And there's something incredibly, uh, how it works psychologically, I'm not sure, but there's something incredibly disarming about that whole thing. Incidentally, while we're on books, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't put these here for this call. I just happened to have them on the table here. So this is, this is social intelligence written by Daniel Goleman, who's actually the guy who came up with, uh, EQ, like emotional intelligence. He was the guy who kind of brought that to the world. And his his new book is actually called social intelligence, where again, he's again, he's talking about the fact that there is a whole different level of intelligence, which is your ability to engage socially with people. And I'm reading that because again, well, you can tell I got all the little, see all the little bookmarks I got there. Because again, it speaks very much to conversational marketing, to conversational copywriting. It's how, how do we display more, uh, it's kind of social, emotional intelligence in our communications with our prospects and our customers. Uh, another little ninja trick, use inclusive words like imagine, you know, imagine you're on a stage and everyone is watching you. How would you feel if, 
what do you think when? Think about the last time. What, what I'm doing is instead of say, talking at someone and being descriptive or being salesy, I'm inviting them to think. I'm inviting them to participate in this kind of thought game that we're having. I'm saying, hey, what, what, what do you think when someone asks you to blah, 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 whatever it is, I'm inviting them to think, to participate, to engage. Uh, super, again, super powerful when you wanna draw people in to a conversation and where you want to kind of engage that that whole kind of prefrontal cortex dynamic of making them feel safe, uh, respected, that there's kind of empathy here that I'm bothering to ask them stuff or I'm bothering to engage them in this communication. This, this is so different from the old school copywriting I used to do where I was trying to persuade at an audience and make them change their mind. It was like me against them. I was trying to overcome their inertia. I wanted to make them buy stuff or make them sign up for stuff. And that was the way of old school copywriting. But online does work so well. People do not like it. Use questions to draw the reader in. So I, I got one or two examples here. Again, this is drawn from a homework assignment because I do have a course about this and there are homework assignments and I'm always kind of fascinated and delighted to see some of the stuff that people contribute. So here's someone talking about, again, going, I think it was that same, the Tenko family resort thing. So here's someone saying, what features do you look for in a hotel? How about a comfortable lobby with friendly staff? Perhaps a gourmet dinner in an upscale restaurant? Or, and then the questions are finished, or maybe you'd like to read, et cetera, et cetera. But what's, what's happening by having those three questions? And it maybe doesn't take three, maybe she could have just used two. By opening with questions, you're, you're engaging the reader. I, I, I'm having to think. I'm not just a passive recipient of information that's being written at me. When you ask me a question, so long as it's relevant, so long as it's not gratuitous, but if you ask me a question that's relevant to the reason that I'm engaging with you, then all of a sudden now I'm involved. What features do you look for? You know, how about a comfortable lobby, friendly stuff? Yeah, go my dinner. Yeah, okay. So as soon as I start saying yeah inside, that's a huge step forward for you if you're trying to sell me. Get me to start thinking, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, yes, that sounds good. You're 80% of the way as soon as you get me kind of nodding and thinking, yep. Uh, try a short line template. So, so here, here, this is another homework, a piece of homework. And I challenged, this person wrote me the first draft of the homework was this long wordy paragraph all about, uh, it's, it's about pool fences for safety so that kids and pets don't fall in the pool. And so I said, look, use a short line template. Give yourself a maximum length per line, maximum length of characters, and just one line per paragraph. So now we have need a fence for your pool. The Guardian fence system is made of transparent mesh, so it doesn't block the view at the pool. Kids can't climb the mesh, and it closes and latches by itself. It's an attractive and super simple way to keep your kids safe. You see how when I'm reading that, it sounds natural, right? It's a spoken word. Whereas some of the other stuff I've been reading feels like, man, this is like it's hard work. It's like being at school reading that stuff. This sounds like a transcript of someone talking to me, which is kind of what we're looking for. This is a, so, so sometimes if you want to make yourself, if you want to, as an exercise, force yourself to write in a more conversational way in a more like spoken language, give yourself an exercise like this. Take something that you've written for your business and say, okay, I'm gonna, it's, I'm, I'm gonna have like maximum 10 words per sentence and one sentence per paragraph. Uh, relax your inner grammar nerd. Uh, people still get all bent out of shape when people use split infinitives and prepositions at the ends of sentences and stuff like that. So this isn't a piece of homework. This is something else I grabbed where uh, the author of a newsletter that I followed about natural health had been she'd taken time off because she was having a baby. And she afterwards then sends out an email saying, my apologies for being out so long. Turns out being a mom takes a lot of time. Who knew LOL? And so that's the kind of joke, but, it, but the way she writes it, uh, again, it's, it's grammatically, it's not correct. Uh, LOL is definitely not part of the proper lexicon when it comes to writing proper stuff. Uh, but again, she's speaking in the language of online media. And in that way, she's relating to people who are using online media.
leave space for your readers. Again, there's another huge, like massive ninja trick thing happening here. So again, we're back to that, uh, the pool safety homework exercise. It's summertime, barbecues on the patio, little ones playing in the field, Fido chasing squirrels, jumping into the pool to cool off. Uh-oh, the pool and its old fence. Give us a call at Guardian Fence, Pool Fence Systems. Let us help you enjoy a worry-free summer. What's interesting about here is all the stuff that isn't said, all right? There's nothing said about, oh my goodness, the kids could fall into the pool. Oh my goodness, the dog could fall into the pool. It's like jumping in the pool to cool off, dot, 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 uh-oh, the pool and its old fence. The reader has to now fill in the space, fill in the rest of the story. Imagine in their minds the kids falling in the pool when the parents were looking the other way. Sometimes when you say too much, when you are too explicit, too complete in your description, you leave no space for the reader. And again, when you do that, you're not, they're not participants in this communication. It's not conversational at all because you're just the boss of everything. This way, when it's written this way, it allows the reader to take part. You've left space in this communication for the reader to fill in the blanks. Now you've engaged that reader. And like I was saying, as soon as you have engagement, now you have more trust, more feeling of, hey, I like listening to this person. This, this feels comfortable. This feels non-threatening. It doesn't feel like they're selling at me. Uh, read your copy out loud. I, I'm going to find this a little bit difficult because some of it's covered on the right by the, by the heads there. But So this is some real text I took from a business. You can move those heads if you need to. You can like drag them over. Just I can. I can drag them. Yeah. Uh, I like... You should have told me that. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So there, yeah, you see. <laughs> I wish I'd known that 25 slides ago. Uh, you probably told me. I probably forgot. So, okay. So this is actually from a, sm a startup company in Silicon Valley. They should know better. Maybe they had their PR company write it. So these changes, this is the before version. These changes reflect our view that tighter integration and closer collaboration between our teams is a crucial component of sustainably growing our business. While this process has required us to make some really tough decisions, we believe that vigorously, sorry, rigorously ensuring our team structure always aligns with our goals will make it, anyway, will make it stronger. So no idea, right? But after I, after I thought about it and went through it a few more times, I figured out what they were actually trying to say. Yeah, we had to fire some people. Uh, but that's what that says. That's what the six lines above actually say. It, it's an announcement saying we've had to fire some people. Uh, but they just couldn't, they just couldn't say it <laughs> that way. They had to sound like complete idiots with that stuff above. So often when you've written text, read it out loud. And if it makes you look like a dick, then it's time to rewrite it. Because there is so much nonsense written out there. And sometimes I think as small businesses, we, we, we kind of look to bigger companies and bigger websites as, as, like, for inspiration sometimes. How do proper companies, how do, how do real companies, how do real marketers speak and write? And sometimes we pick up stuff of theirs that is actually not good and, and not something that we should be copying. Um, so, yeah, the simple text. There's lots of reasons for reading stuff out loud, but one of them is to make sure you're not sounding like a complete idiot with your with your text with your copy so a few more things to remember we're kind of getting into the home straight here on on this part of the presentation but uh on the left there if your copy isn't conversational you're just interrupting your readers so remember interruption marketing is what we did in the old school media days with tv radio uh, all broadcast media that's what we did we interrupted. So if your copy online isn't conversational, you're kind of weird because it's like you're speaking to old media. You're writing for old media instead of new media. So on the right, stop being adversarial. Stop pushing. Stop being the bad person trying to make the push and make the sale. Forget that whole them and us mentality. And, and it's, it's still out there. I come across it. I, you know, I know where it comes from. It really comes from that old school uh, you know, before the web of, of them and us. Uh, don't, don't be that. Don't do that. It's not them and us. It's just us. 
if you if you want to build solid relationships with your prospects, with your members, with your customers, with your clients, it's just us. It's never them and us. It, it's weird. Like as a copywriter, always I like to, and, and sometimes my clients have taken this the wrong way, but I've said to clients, um, I, I'm I'm on your customer's side. I'm not on your side, and they're like. What? what? <laughs> You're meant to be on our side. We're paying you to sell stuff to those people. And I'm saying, yeah, but I can do a much better job at that if, I, if I'm not on your side, if I'm on their side. And if they feel that I'm on their side, so that when they read my copy, they, they don't feel that it's a them and us thing. They feel that it's just an us thing and that I have their best, in, best interests at heart. So, hey, Chris, when you're selling, like you, you sell stuff because you genuinely believe that what you're selling is going to be helpful to your audience, right? Absolutely. And yeah, I yeah. say that same thing where uh, I'm really loyal to my customer's customer. I kind of almost yeah. think about them on a higher pedestal. Yeah. I'm... Yeah. And, and that's part of the mindset. That's part of the whole conversational copywriting mindset. Hey, I've just put a name to this thing. What Chris does is conversational copywriting. I'm not the first or the only person to talk about this. I just have this particular description of it to help kind of codify and clarify and turn this into something of a process. Uh, don't try to change people's minds. Have you ever tried to change the mind of someone in your family, your husband, your wife, your teenage kids? You can't change people's minds. If you do, you just find yourself pushing and pushing and pushing and then voices are raised and then everyone stops communicating and it all goes to hell. The amygdala uh, is all fired up, right? Absolutely. It's, a, it's amygdala <laughs> heaven. It's like a barbecue of the amygdala. <laughs> right. So dial back to persuasion. Treat your readers with respect. Uh, and that last one, it sounds so obvious. But there are a lot of companies that don't do that. Hey, one, 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 there's people in our space, like the kind of information marketing space, the education space. I sometimes come across people, marketers in our space, who, who are teaching what they do. And they say, oh, I love this business because if, if I need money, then I just fire out an email to my list, not to people, to my list. And, and then the money pours in and I can pay my tax, taxes or buy a new car. And I think to myself, you know what, F you. You know, you're, you're, you're treating, you're not treating your audience with respect, your, your, your readers with respect, your customers with respect. You're treating them like a, a bank that you can manipulate into giving you money. I mean, that kind of mindset, I, I, I hate that. And, and I, don't, I don't think those people then survive in the long term because people get to understand that they get to feel that about Mark is that, Hey, you know what? He's talking the talk. He's pretending to be my friend. He's pretending to be my buddy. He's pretending to be conversational, but he's not, he's just an asshole. <laughs> if you excuse my language. Um, and, and that is, that is another big no, no in my mind. There's lots of people out there who use stuff that sounds like conversational copy. They're all chatty. I'll get something like, Hey, Nick, buddy, in an email, uh, they're not my buddy, they don't know me, it's just all code. And they say, hey, me and my wife were on the beach this morning and I was thinking about you. No, you weren't, don't lie to me. So just because, just because someone uses a conversational tone of voice uh, doesn't mean they're doing what, I, what I'm talking about here. Uh, it's like fake conversation. It's fake buddy. And, and, and that in a sense is almost the worst thing of all to my mind. Uh, parting sound bites, because I just love throwing up little things on Instagram sometimes. Uh, one great customer relationships. You can't get there by shouting. Okay. Again, you get the uh, amygdala barbecue when you do that. Uh, in the middle, conversational copy is engaging, not demanding. And on the right, this is how you sell stuff without being a creep, conversational copywriting. So I keep coming up with these little things. And I think, huh, I think I will turn that into something on Instagram uh, that at least five people can see immediately getting the word out. All right. So now for, I'm allowed to do a little promotion here, aren't I, Chris? Yeah, go ahead. Just a little bit. But in a conversational tone, of course. So yes, I, I have a course. I'm, I'm like you, I'm a course creator. Uh, I have a website about conversational copywriting, a blog all about it. And yes, I have a course. And it's, actually, it's not on Lift LMS. I've never heard of it. Unfortunately, at the time I, I kind of set this up, it's on Teachable, but you recognize the on the right there. It's a series of video lectures like this. It is PowerPoint with me doing voiceover. 
Um, and yeah, so this is this this is my little pitch, and here's what you get in that course. Uh, hey, basically, it's like what we've just done, but you know, 10 times or 20 times or 50 times over. So there are 21 separate PowerPoint video lectures. Uh, there's a whole bunch of bonus items because I keep adding stuff. There's videos, PDF documents, all kinds of stuff. Among the PDFs is actually a quite separate course. It's a 97 page course on content optimization. It's actually a whole different course I created as a video course and that I had transcribed and turned into a PDF. So you actually have a, a whole separate second course folded into this. And then the bold bits, I'll, I'll, I'll mention why they're bold in a minute, but basically when you, when you take the course, uh, as you saw from some slides in the presentation, you get some homework assignments. You actually get six separate homework assignments. You get to do those assignments and I will give you personal one-on-one -on -one feedback. You get feedback on me from me and I'll even suggest you do say, hey, try a second version and then I'll give you feedback on the second version. Uh, it's actually kind of nuts, but that's what I'm doing right now for everyone who takes part in the course. So like Chris, I also have a, you know, a private Facebook group for conversational copywriting community, which gets kind of, we're, we're a pretty passionate bunch um, and you get access to that indefinitely. I do a live Q and A uh, on, on Facebook within that private group once a month month and you get access to that indefinitely and th those bold bits like I say we'll, we'll get there so here's the deal 20% um, discount for Lifter LMS so it's 157 instead of 197 and the offer expires in four hours and three minutes I'm just kidding just kidding it does not uh, so the link below and now I gotta move this because now I'm covering the link it's no good at all there we go so the link below, that is gonna take you to a page where you can save 20% on the course. You get a discount. It won't expire in four hours and 30 minutes. That link has been up there for a while. It'll still be up there for a while. So even if you're coming back to this in a few days or maybe even a week or two, it'll still be there. And in fact, it'll probably be there for a very long time at 20%. But going back to those bold parts on the slide before, uh, I got to change my pricing soon because I don't, it's particularly that homework feedback. Uh, it's kind of nuts for me to give people personal feedback on the homework for six different assignments for, you know, 197 or 157 bucks. Uh, so anyway, so, so hands up anyone who has trouble pricing their courses. <laughs> Because I, Chris, I've talked with Chris about this before. He, you know, he he knows I'm pathetic like this. My my prices should be way higher right now, and, and I just struggle with putting my prices up. But I have to because if you have uh, live feedback. I mean, it's there's a cost to that. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm giving you one-on-one -on -one feedback um, on on your homework on six different pieces of homework. Uh, it's kind of nuts for me to do that for that price point. So actually what I'm going to do, and I'm probably going to do it in the next week or two, is there will still be a $197 version, but that'll be without any feedback, no homework feedback, probably no Facebook. It'll just be the course standalone. And that the course itself will, I, I'm going to add, I don't know, one or $200 to that. Um, because hey, I, I mean, I just should, I need to, I'm, I'm kind of nuts not to. So that's my rush, rush, hush, hur, hurry, hurry. It's not that the offer is going to go down. Uh, it's just that the 20% will still be there. It's just the price is probably going to go up pretty soon because this whole thing right now is a little unsustainable. So there's the URL at the bottom, conversationalcopywriting.com forward slash course dash RDU 20. That's where you get your discount. Um, and thank you. Uh, if you got any, we're going to do some questions. If you have more questions afterwards, um, then you can email me anytime you like at that email address below. And now I'm going to move that down again so I don't cover that, that URL so you've got time to write that down. And so, Chris, that's the end of my formal part. But if we've got people with questions, then let's, uh, let's jump in. Yeah, there's some questions there. Great presentation, by the way. That was really really awesome i'm gonna yeah, go back and watch this again i actually i personally have tons of questions for you <laughs> but uh, i'm gonna go to the audience first all right <laughs> that was a that was a great presentation um oh, for those you. of you for those of you watching go check out next course but also just check out his website at conversationalcopywriting.com he also has a a guide you can get called five quick and easy ways 
to make your writing more conversational. So that's something you can get by just dropping your email. If you want to just kind of check things out, if you're not quite ready to do the deep dive on the course yet, check that out. But uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend the course because this, this concept of, hey, the world has changed. We're no, we don't live in a broadcast world anymore. And in case you didn't get the memo, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a big thing. I mean, sometimes change like kind of sneaks up on us. Like all of a sudden, like 50% of the internet is on mobile phones. All of a yeah. sudden, like yeah. selling is a conversation. It's not a broadcast. It's, it's really interesting how this stuff sneaks up on us. Um, Hey, there's, a, there's a wonderful quote, and I've forgotten yeah. who said it, and I'll probably misquote it, but you, you'll get the general idea, which is that the future creeps up on us slowly, and then all at once. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's creeping, and then suddenly it's there, like before you even realize. It's been creeping up on you, and then suddenly it's everywhere. Yeah, all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's super cool. And you're getting a lot of um, Joseph saying thank you, Gail's super pumped. Don was saying worth every minute. Okay. Um, good. And we've That's got, good. we've got some questions. So I want to get into the people's yeah. questions. Um, stick around. If you're here, we've got hands up, keep raising your hands. We'll do the live questions last. We're going to kind of rock through some of the written ones first. And uh, then we're going to be doing a giveaway. We're going to be giving away uh, one seat in Nick's course. We're also yeah. going to be giving away a $99 lift drill MS on, on and then two more, uh, related to Lifter LMS that are a little different that I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit when we get to the giveaway section. But we're going to do Q&A here for a little bit. And um, feel free to use the Q&A box. It looks like a lot of you are using the chat, which is fine. If you're watching this over in Facebook, just leave a comment over there and we'll get to those as well. But I'm just going to kind of scroll backwards um, <clears throat> to some of the questions I saw. Uh, let's see one second here. Uh, somebody is watching, uh, Dennis who lives near you actually is asking if you're related to Ron Osborne on the West Island. Just throwing that out there. Ron Osborne. Is that U S B O R N E? O S B O R N E. Oh, you, no, my name is my, mine's I'm spelt with a U at the beginning. U S B O R N E. <laughs> yeah. He's in, uh, my, he's in the Montreal area as well. Oh, um, all right. Okay. Hi. So Joseph asks, what's the difference between asking for a sale and offering, offering a solution? So is that like closing versus? It's like, it's like I, think, I think a solution is like, hey, I, I'm trying to offer you a solution as to how to, to write, write stronger sales copy without being a creep about it. But yeah, I'm still going to, if you go, if you go to my website and if you get, you go to that page, it's a sales page. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you lots of good reasons why I think this is going to be helpful to you. And at the end, just like anyone else, I, I have buttons. I have say, Hey, you know, like buy here. I, I, so I want, I want to close the sale, but when, if I close the sale, I don't want to f you to feel that I've bullied you into it or pushed you into it. I don't want any kind of buyer's remorse. I want to be like saying, hey, like, I, I got something I think is super valuable that can be really helpful to you. And yeah, if you click this button, you can get it. So yeah, there's a transaction. Uh, I get some money and then I give you way too much in return. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think I've forgotten the exact phrase of the question, but I think it's the two stages. Is, is there's, the, there's the part where you're engaging with someone saying, yeah, I think I have something valuable for you. But then even... You know, even as a conversational copywriter or marketer, uh, you still have to ask for the sale. I'm not, I'm not saying that you become so kind of fluffy and candy flossy that you never ask for the sale. You do, but you do it in a way that's more respectful, that it's not pushy. And you make the sale when someone feels, yeah, I feel super comfortable doing this. I want to do this. I want to buy this. This is a really good use of my money and my time. Yeah. There's something I do. If you look at almost any blog post I ever write, uh, in the very last part of the blog post, I usually have a section called, here's what I'd like you to do next, dot, dot, dot. And then right. I, I literally ask for the sale about something. But there's a bunch of content above that. Give, give, yeah. give, add value, talk about stuff. And then if there is something related to what I was talking about that would be helpful to invest in, I ask for the sale. So you still have right. to ask for the sale. You do, you do. But it's like, it's like by that time, I want you to trust me. I want and you it's, to 
It's like you said, the amygdala is not, you're not like asking for the sale on first interaction and the amygdala right. is firing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, yeah, I, I feel super comfortable buying from this person. Um, we've got a question from Ali about writer's block. Any specific advice or techniques for overcoming writer's blocks when you are stuck in your copywriting? Any tips for how to get over that writer's block hump? I think you gave some good tips in your presentation with the, um, the tools like the open-ended questions. The, yeah, uh, you can, for sure you can play around with that. You know, the mirroring, the open-ended questions, the including the reader, all that stuff, just use that as devices. I think I, I, got, I, got, I got two answers to that question. I, I think often you get writer's block when the, the problem actually is that you haven't figured out what to say. And I think when you're not sure what to say, it's really hard <laughs> to get started. And we think, oh, yeah, but I know what to say. I want to say that, you know, here are five reasons to buy this course or buy this product or service. And it's, yeah, but that's too broad. You haven't re quite figured out what to say more specifically. What's going to be the best approach? So, so as I go back to that, that whole slide I had about asking questions, getting to know your audience, is if I want inspiration of like what I should say instead of me struggling with it I'll go over like I said I'll read some Amazon reviews I'll look at them social media I'll, I'll go back to that old survey I did I'll use some of the language or the statements or the concerns of my readers as a jumping off point as a starting point for me the other thing and, 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 I, and I, I have to be careful I don't want to be rude here um, but if I'm talking to a group of people I already know um, I say, you know what, writer's block, just like, just keep working, just push through it. We're craftspeople. You know, we're like roofers. We're like, we're, we're like carpenters. We're craftspeople. Our craft is words. Uh, you know, if, if, if I hire roofers, I don't expect to go up there and find this guy sitting there with his head in time <laughs> saying I got roofing block. So I don't, I don't mean to be rude, but I, like, I, I, I'm tough like that with myself. If I find myself thinking, oh, I've got writer's block. I'll think, come on, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll kind of figuratively like slap myself and say, you know what, you just got to grind through it. Or I'll think, you know what, you just need a fresh perspective. Like, go and see what your customers are saying. Uh, get get inspiration from somewhere, or, or just give yourself an exercise. Like, uh, if there were three different ways for me to open this, what might they be? So you're kind of taking the stress off. The other thing I do with writer's block is sometimes the writer's block is about the opening, right? It's about the headline of the first paragraph. Oh my goodness, what am I going to say? So I think, okay, let me leave that be. Imagine that we're in place and I start writing from the middle onwards or from paragraph five onwards, like the comfortable stuff, the stuff that I know about. And then you start writing that. And then you think, huh, that'll make a good interesting headline. So now you have your headline, which actually, again, it says non-threatening to you. There's no pressure. You're just typing that middle stuff on the page. And then you think, huh, interesting. So I think as writers, often we, we think as we write. Okay. So sometimes what will happen is I'll, 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 whenever I'm writing a page, I, I never try to write the perfect headline before I write the first paragraph. I always throw in a placeholder headline and I know that nine times out of 10, I will rewrite it and replace it probably several times. But again, I put in the placeholder headline to take the pressure off. Like, hey, I know it's not perfect. That's cool. That's fine. Then I start writing. And as I write, it's like the process of writing is helping me think and develop develop my thinking about this and I'll get like paragraph two or three. And then I have that like, huh, actually I'd be much better off starting here. So I turn the beginning of paragraph four into a headline and then I dump what I've written for. And so that's the other thing. Don't be shy about dumping stuff like, Oh my goodness. But that paragraph was so be Just dump it. Just dump. It's just words. All right. So yeah, I just use all these different tricks. So first I slap myself and say, don't be a baby. You're a craftsperson. Your job is to write, keep writing. And then I'll use these various devices, whether it's looking for what, what my customers, the language of my customers, or otherwise starting in the middle, or otherwise using placeholders, taking the pressure of myself. So here's a placeholder headline. Here's roughly what I think I might end up with. And then you start writing, and then you go back and improve it. I like every page, even if it's a, a blog post, I'll probably rewrite the headline or, or tweak it. Uh, 
four, five, six, seven, eight times before I publish it. And I've been doing this for 39 years. If I'm writing a sales page, uh, I'll probably write that headline 20 different times. And then once I've published it, I'll probably change it another 10 times <laughs> over the following two weeks. Uh, so again, don't, don't stress about going for perfection with that first draft, because that for sure will block you, because I don't think any of us can do that. We can never, we can never get it absolutely right the first time. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I just want to add to that, that that placeholder headline could be a blog post. It could be an ad on social media. It could be a subject line and an email that goes in your marketing or your new student onboarding. It could be the actual name of the course and then the description of the course and what it's all about. So it's a, it's a very, it's a tool that's, you know, you can use in a lot of different places. And I do the yeah. same thing with this, especially with an email. I drop a subject line in there, but I always get inspired, you know, once I get into the content of the email. Absolutely. Like I, yeah, absolutely. But I always, I, I, I kind of, it, it's, it's like giving you a starting spot, like the placeholder, like gives you something to hang everything else from, and then you go back and make it better. But you're, you're tr it's like the, yeah, subject lines are like headlines. I don't think I've ever, ever gone with my first version of a subject line. Yeah. And when you get, have fun with it. Like for me personally, I actually have an incredible amount of fun with subject lines because the goal is to get people to open the email, but not like deceive them and have them have, like you say, right. buyer's remorse. You still want the headline to deliver the goods, Yeah, but it's an opportunity to have a lot of fun and you know, you kind of, it's fun. <laughs> well, what I, one of the things I do with, with subject lines is, is again, I make them open-ended. So if I say, Hey, do you love peanut butter? is a subject line you say yes or no and you don't need to open it because you've already i've asked the question if you answered it and you're done so i, I always try and make a subject line open-ended so that people feel kind of intrigued or interested like huh i better see what this is about and now you got them into the email on i'm going to move on to another question from joseph um i see you got your hand up joseph we'll bring you up in a little bit uh but he has a question about uh asking for feedback on a facebook page um, but he's, uh, he's not getting a lot and Facebook costs money on pages to be, um, you know, to get reach. And I, and <clears throat> so if I can paraphrase on and just add to that, oh, I would just, your audio. Oh, did you lose my audio? I can't hear you. Not at all. That's weird. Um, let me just switch real quick. Wow. How about now? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, I just switched. Apparently, these USB microphones fail sometimes. That's why I have three microphones on the wall right now. Oh, really? Um, wow. So, uh, and if I could just add to Joseph's question a little bit, um, sometimes as copywriters or we're just launching a new project, we feel like we're kind of talking into the darkness and we're not getting that flywheel started. Like, how do we get it started? And my advice to you, Joseph, would be you would definitely want to focus on a Facebook group way more than a page because the conversations happen in the groups. Yeah. Pages are more for like paid promotions and things like that. But what's your advice, Nick, to somebody who's trying to get initial traction on conversation? They're asking for feedback from an audience and not getting it. I hear you. It's not easy. Like I, I launched the kind of conversational copywriting thing uh, kind of seriously about six, eight months ago, I guess now. And yeah, the beginning is hard to get people to pay any kind of attention um, because it's, it's really noisy out there. As soon as I was able to get a community of even half a dozen people who took the course, and these were, these were the first half a dozen were probably people who knew me already and had probably taken some other course with me at some point. They already trusted me and they got into it. And, and like Chris said, I actually immediately, the, one of the first things I did was to create uh, a private Facebook page because that builds a sense of community far more than a regular Facebook page. So, but, but getting that first feedback, that first traction on anything that you're launching uh, absolutely does take time and effort and it can be discouraging and it can, I mean, I've been doing this forever, but, but my journey with conversational copywriting for those first few months is, Oh, you, you know, you suddenly you get people buying and then days go by and nobody buys it and you think, Oh my God, what am I doing wrong? And why isn't anyone engaging and why aren't people hearing what I have to say? 
and it goes up. It's like a roller coaster. And if, if I have one skill set or one advantage in this whole thing that's kept me going for all these decades, it's that I'm a persistent son of a bitch. I just don't, I just don't quit. When I really want something to work, I just keep pushing and pushing. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm really answering your question, but I'm acknowledging the fact that it can be really tough to get that first little bit of traction. And I'll tell you, I'm probably, I shouldn't say this as a conversational copywriter, but I'm probably a little bit sneaky insofar as, let's say in the conversational copywriting Facebook group, uh, two people say yay to something. Then if I'm writing a blog post or writing a guest post or writing to, I might say, hey, and a ton of people agree with me when, all right? So I'm, I'm kind of stretching the truth when I take feedback from my first two customers and then say, hey, a ton of people agree with me when. But it's like in the early stages, like you, you, gotta, use, you gotta use what you have. Um, so yeah, I, prob I probably in the first few weeks and, and even months, I was kind of overstating the degree of engagement with conversational copywriting because I was getting great feedback. Uh, I just wasn't getting enough of it, but I wanted to make a, I wanted to make a noise disproportionate to where I was at at that point. Because if you, if, if I'd been totally open and transparent, saying, you know what, I've only got six people taking the course, then I, I can't do that because people think, oh, well, if only six people bought it, it can't be any good. And it was like me, like, well, no, that's not it. It's just that it's really, really hard to get traction for something new when you just launched it. It's still, yeah, but only six people, nah, I'm not gonna buy that. So yeah, you, you just go for the small victories. Um, and again, going back to what Chris said, absolutely, just as soon as you can dive into a private group, because that's where you get much, much better conversation and engagement. Uh, and, and just get those very small victories and then build them out, like try, kind of amplify your victories as much as you can in the early days so people get this positive vibe about what you're doing. I'm not sure that answers the question, but. <laughs> I think it helps. And, uh, and there, it also doesn't have to be, you can start a group, but you can also just engage in other people's already existing groups in your niche. Yeah. And also just to share Joseph with you, this is where the magician shows his tricks. I remember the first time I talked to you and I was doing something that most people don't do, which is I have a, a way to schedule a 15 minute call with me. And I remember driving around in my car, uh, doing, going to pick up my kids and it was your time on our, our call slot. So it's all automated. People can have a conversation with me about Lifter or whatever they're doing. And we talked for a little bit. I answered your questions. I, I heard you out and we had, we had a conversation. So making yourself available for conversation, that's exactly how you ended up in this ecosystem and ultimately on this call right here. So just wanted yeah. to point that out. Um, so uh, in the chat is a link to Nick's course. It's conversationalcopywriting.com forward slash course dash RDU20. Um, check that out and in that course, Nick doesn't just provide information. He has homework and gives you personalized feedback. We have a question right now for personalized feedback on a, on a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a question about a course that's designed around increasing levels of happiness right. and trying to get people into a, you know, a lead magnet or a, a, a free thing before the paid thing. In this case, yep. uh, a 14 day class in happiness. So I'm going to read the tweet. Um, it says, you are amazing. My Twitter friend, I'd love to email you my free 14 day class in happiness. These 14 amazing and helpful tips on being happier will help you stay positive. Imagine taking a break from the stress of politics and social arguing. And then there's the link. So any, any feedback if that came in as a homework assignment? I would say that you're you're trying to you're trying to say too many different things. You're trying to do too much in a tweet. Uh, I'd, I'd keep the tweet super simple. So if if your purpose, you know, when you're talking about you start towards the end of that tweet, you're talking about uh, about politics. 
All right. So first you were talking about happiness. Then you're talking about, I want to send you stuff by email, which made me feel a little bit uncomfortable because I don't like strangers sending me stuff by email. Uh, and maybe it's just the way you said it. Maybe you're actually going to send me a page where I'm going to click on a link and it'll be a download. That's cool. But you're going to send me an attachment by email? No, no, no thank you. Not if you're a stranger. So you, you want to be careful there. But also, you're, you're making me think about more than one thing. I'm thinking about the download. I'm thinking about politics. I'm thinking about, what is it you talked about? Social stress or something. Social arguing. Right, social arguing. So that's three things you, you got me thinking about. And there was probably a fourth in there. Uh, you want to whittle that down, <laughs> holding my fingers up underneath so you can't see. <laughs> I am so impressive. So you want to, you want to whittle that down to one thing. Yeah, you just just because a tweet it, it costs you nothing, right? Unless you're paying for, unless it's paid. But uh, you can you, you can say, okay, I'm going to do a series of four tweets today or four tweets this week. Just make one point. So you, one is about just on the free download. One focus is just on the stress of politics. One focus is just on the social arguing thing. It's actually I was I'm, I'm writing a. I was writing a post this morning on, on four reasons why people stop reading before they get to the end of your page. And, and one of the reasons that I talk about is you're trying to talk about too many things in one communication. So whittle that particularly with a tweet, because tweet is like people read it like bang, 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 fast, fast, fast. So always one point per tweet. That'd be my feedback for you. And there's a saying that confused mind doesn't buy. So I don't know. Sure. I don't know. No, I, I'd give credit to somebody, but I'm not sure who that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, uh, Rahul is asking, with so many tips that were talked about here, how many should we include in each piece of copy? Is there some kind of checklist? So a couple of things. This We are going to have a replay video. Even though you're here, you'll still get the email. So if you want to go back and look at the slides and especially the how to section of things you can try, um, that's going to be up. We don't do any scarcity stuff. That webinar, that training will always be up that you can go reference. Nick also has his five quick and easy ways to make your writing more conversational. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that is and, and also, you know, just address this desire for a checklist? I lost your voice again. Is it gone? I, if that's you. I hope that's not me. If we down to your final microphone. <laughs> oh no, I hear you again. Hear you. I'll just put the other one back in. Right, isn't that weird? Uh, so I think you asked me this before. I can never remember exactly what the five points are. But that, hey, the, the, in, in, in the free guide, the free download. So, so that's, my, that's my lead magnet, right? when we're talking about process. Actually, part of that lead magnet is, is you're getting the free guide plus uh, three videos. Um, but yeah, this is just a very simple introduction as to five quick and easy things you can do. And, and some of them will overlap with what I've talked about in this presentation. But going back to the question, I, I, I think what I heard in the question was uh, maybe a thought that you need to kind of do all of what I've been talking about. You don't very often it's just one thing like you'll take one of the things i talk about is mostly it's about mindset it's it's when you're if you're looking at your website now or your sales page now or your email sequences or your conversion sequence whatever you whatever kind of promotional marketing activity you have just read through it have a look at what you've been doing and say hey does this make me feel conversational or does this make me feel old school, like I'm trying to push this down their throats? Uh, and so review that. So that, that, that the, the, the five step guide thing is very much about reviewing your existing copy and finding simple ways to kind of shift that mindset. So once you've shifted the mindset and say, you know what, I want this to be more kind of not them and us, but more us, us, uh, more respectful of my audience, more helpful to my audience, as if I were, selling to a friend across my kitchen table over coffee. Um, once you got that mindset, then all the other tips and tricks that I talked about in this presentation, which you can go back and kind of copy down or, or download or whatever, uh, they're just the tools. That's just stuff you do. Step one is the mindset, is, is that I want, to, I want to make this more engaging, more respectful of my audience and make them feel that I'm their friend and that I'm non-threatening and that I'm here to help them 
that everything I do, everything I sell is, is, is here to help them. Uh, once that mindset is in place, then it's just simply a matter of deploying whatever kind of approach or, or technique best works for you in that circumstance. That's super helpful. Um, I, I'm going to kind of combine two questions here. Um, one question uh, from Tanya is just about frustration of not getting a lot of course sales. And uh, a comment from somebody else, from Joseph, is asking, kind of commenting. So it's about authenticity and compassion while asking for the sale, correct? Yeah. That's a question. Now, if we're not getting course sales, it, it might not be a, a marketing problem. It could be the core offer itself is not, is, there's not like a product market fit. Or it could be a conversational marketing communication problem where there's this, it's, it's like the world's best kept secret. You're, you need to improve like how you talk about your course or create more content that's gonna attract people to it. Let's assume we're dealing with, we have a great course, we're not necessarily trained as marketers, we, we don't yeah. uh, have an advertising background. What are some ways to, other ways, we kind of talk, touch on this a little bit, but to get that flywheel spinning and get conversations happening besides Facebook groups? Hey, a lot, a lot of it is, is the hard slog of starting any business. Um, and, I, and I've been, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a secret. So I, I've been doing this forever. I've been, I've been an online copywriter since 1997. I've been speaking at conferences since 1997 about the craft of online copywriting. I know a whole bunch of heavy hitters in this industry. And you know how many of them like helped me out with the launch of com conversational copywriting? Uh, I think one of them a little bit. Uh, it's, so I found myself, uh, I, I, I thought I had this leverage that these old buds of mine would help me out in a big way, but they didn't. And I'm not quite sure why. Maybe I'm not as likable as I think I am. <laughs> Maybe I just pissed them off over the years. But so I found myself in a very similar position of, of how do I actually get the word out? And in fact, one of the things I do is exactly what I'm doing right now is I reach out to people like Chris. So in fact, the exposure I've got for conversational copywriter has really been the kind of copywriting has really been the kindness of strangers. Like I, Chris, when did we first meet? Like a couple of months ago, a couple of, couple of months ago. And here we are. Um, and so I, the, the, the blog post I talked about, I was writing this morning, that's a guest post um, for another website. So I've been uh, offering myself like available for podcasts. I've been writing to people saying, hey, should I write a guest post for you? I've been interviewing people for my website. So I know that my problem, I think like, hey, I'm in the same. I'd love to sell more of my copies of my course. I, I mean, I'm selling them. And it's fine and it's a nice you know like I'm, I'm happy with where i'm at but for it to be a long-term sustainable business i need to do more and that means it's a numbers game i need more people becoming aware who then come to the site maybe they grab the lead magnet and then i've got to convert more to to actually buy the course but it's all about the numbers coming in at the front end. So you can have a fantastic course. You can have a fantastic kind of product market fit. You can have fantastic marketing on your site. But if you don't have enough people coming through the front door, coming into the store to begin with, then you don't get enough sales. So it, it comes down to math in the end. So that, that's one of the things I'm doing right now. Hey, it's why I'm here right now. Well, one is I love talking about this stuff, but also uh, because when you know Chris and I talk and he was talking about you guys I was thinking oh man these guys you know I think I hope that you'd love to hear about conversational copywriting because we live in a world where the trust of our buyers is paramount because we're going to have a long-term relationship with them so I thought oh this is a great fit I'd love to get in front of your guys and so here we are so I'm reaching out all the time so and again most of the time I reach out to people saying hey would you like me to write a guest post? Should we do a podcast? Would you like me to do a webinar? Whatever it is, most of the time people say no. But you just, you just have to be, if you believe in what you're doing, if you believe that it's helpful, that it's useful, and I do, I'm, like, I'm nuts about conversational copywriting. I, I think it's, 
I've always kind of been this way. I've always been a kind of reluctant copywriter. I, I'm good at it, but I, I don't really like selling, but I like getting good stuff in front of people if it's going to be useful to them. Uh, so I believe in this completely. So, so I'm relentless. So I get, you know, it, it's, it, it's normal when you start a business, when you start launching a course, when you're launching any kind of uh, endeavor that most of the time what you hear is no, no, thank you. If you're lucky. Uh, so you just persist, persist, persist. And, and I think in our business, so long as you have a decent course, so long as you have a half decent sales page, uh, a lot of it's going to come down to the numbers coming in the front door. So that's why uh, probably in terms of like conversational copywriting as a business of mine, uh, probably 80% of my time is devoted to just that one thing, trying to get more people in through the front door. That's awesome. <clears throat> um this is, if anybody uh, wants to raise your hand and talk live, go ahead and do that. I'm going to ask Nick one question selfishly for me. And then if we have any people who want to talk live, we'll take that. And then we're going to do our giveaway, our series of giveaways here. All right. Uh, but my, my question, it's actually not for me. It kind of is, but it's for this community because I see <laughs> people asking. I just see where I, I'm obsessed with where people get stuck. Because launching an online course project, or especially if it's a side hustle, there's so many um, like snares and traps out there waiting to stall people out and prevent them from launching, or you know, demotivate them so that they give up and things like that. So I'm always trying to remove friction around all that stuff. When you get into the world of advertising and copywriting and marketing, one of the places I see people get stuck myself included, I'm speaking from personal experience, is um, branding, design, you know, logos, how the website looks, um, yeah. color palettes, you know, the course image, ebook covers, these kinds of things. Yeah. And as a, as a marketing and advertising profession, professional, I wanted to ask you to riff on it a little bit for the audience. When I was new to marketing, and I started learning the difference between branding and direct response marketing. I had a bunch of light bulbs go off and I was like, you know what? I'm going to focus on direct response. Like I, I still try to do, it's an 80, 20 thing. Like um, I still focus 20% on general branding, making sure design looks good, but it is not a priority. I'm often looking for something specific to happen, even if it's just engagement, not necessarily closing a sale. But could you talk a little bit about, branding versus direct response? Sure. So I, I basically actually my answer to you is yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I'll tell you like, so about two months ago, um, I hired a designer because, because my, my first iteration, my first version of conversational copywriting the website was uh, pretty much handmade by me in WordPress. Uh, it wasn't bad looking, but I wanted it to look more professional. And, and that was part of my desire to be able to increase the price. I thought, hey, if this looks more professional, I can charge more. And so we did. I found a very nice designer. She did a great job for me. Um, and I, you know, I spent, you know, four figures on redesign and, and cleaning up the logo and just making everything look sharper and more professional. Um, and we launched it and I didn't make a sale for a week afterwards. And I was totally freaking out. <laughs> Anyway, things have, things have sorted themselves out now. In fact, one of the things I did is actually I took out some of the design elements, the new design elements, design elements, particularly on the sales page. Um, I, I took out a lot of the images that we'd put in. I made it much more kind of text centered, much simpler to read through and, and definitely less kind of decorative imagery around. I think that if you have a, a valuable course and you articulate its value reasonably well, and you get your message out there, uh, then I think branding, design, and everything else is secondary. Uh, I actually stood up at a, at a, d a web design conference uh, many years ago, and I stood up and there was a, a room full of about 700 web designers. And I stood up being the foolish, arrogant person that I am and said, your job is to make my words look good. Um, and they were very gracious. 
and nobody booed me or threw anything at me. Uh, but though I said it in a very, it, it was a, it was a very blunt way of putting it. Um, I still stand by that. I think the role of a, on the web, the role of a designer is to to make the words look good, to help to help the the communication. Hey, if you if you if you go to a website, if you strip out all the images, all the design elements, you're just left with the words. You got something, right? Go to a website, beautifully designed. You strip out the words. What do you got? You got nothing. Nothing. Strip out the words, and you have nothing. You won't make a single sale. The word, it's always the words that do the heavy lifting, the, that actually open the sale, close the sale. And yes, design is, is good. It's, I mean, I, I'm actually a, a real fan of design. I love good design. Uh, but I found that particularly in direct response, which is kind of where we're in, you know, we're trying to sell stuff direct from our websites, um, that design is mostly about keeping things clean and simple and not getting in the way of the reader. Uh, just create a, make it a simple experience, get out of the way, uh, allow people to, you know, immerse themselves in your message. Uh, and by all means, make things look good, uh, but keep it clean. Don't, don't clutter things with too much design. That is awesome. Um, Joseph's got his hand up. We're going to take his question live. Uh, if you're here right now, check out conversationalcopywriting.com forward slash course dash RDU 20. That's in the chat. If you're watching the replay, there's a button below this video that links you over to get that 20% discount on next course. So we're going to take Je Joseph's question now, and then we're going to do our four giveaways. Welcome, Joseph. I'm going to unmute you. It looks like you might, um, oh. Hello. Hey. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Nick and Chris. You're both awesome. Really enjoyed and appreciated this presentation. I'm learning a lot and I'm gonna rewatch it to learn what I just learned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things I'm, I'm wrestling with is the, uh, when I send my emails, uh, after I've given my lead magnet and uh, to share some value, I hope, with people. And yeah. then I, I um, wrestle with how often to ask them to go and uh, get what it is that I'm selling. So um, people say, oh, well, one out of five emails should be a sales email. The other should be providing value. Do you have a theory about that? And I've heard somebody else say, just ask, uh, always be asking for the sale. Um, and um, it, we used to say ABS, always be selling when I was in the phone sales. <laughs> but, so you're, are you uh, talking about making the transition from lead magnet to paid product kind of? When I, when I send the emails after they opt in and I say, oh, it's great here. I'm glad you got it. Let me share some more value about what you got. And by the way, if you want even more, you can get our paid plan, right? So I'm hesitant to ask you know, for the sale on every email, but I feel like maybe if I do, I'll make more money. Okay. So, so I think that, and Chris, you can, you can say if your experience is different with my experience, if I, if I'm sending out useful informational, like somebody signed up, they, they've, they read the guide and, and stuff and they're happy and they're interested and engaged. And then I, what I found is that if I then just send them um, informational high value emails and then at the end of that email I say oh by the way uh be sure to sign up for the course if you're ready uh i i get almost no sales at all so if you so if, if you you got a couple of choices right now with actually you got three choices right now you can not bother with me at all which is fine you can get a conversational copywriting and buy the course right now if you choose instead like oh, i don't know about this guy i think i'll just sign up for the lead and maybe i'll buy the course later what will happen to you is you will get the you'll get the download like right now today and then i'm going to tell you hey tomorrow you're going to get a video and I'm going to send you a video each day for three days. And so that is like now uh, this is a specific onboarding sequence. It's a conversion sequence. I've, I've got you in with the free guide. I'm now there's a four day sequence where I'm specifically going to try and convert you now by day four. 
because I know that after day four, if I just send you informational emails, I'm going to have a pretty low conversion rate. Now, I do know how to increase that conversion rate, which is why maybe once a quarter, I will think of a reason why, okay, we're going to have a sale. We're going to have a discount. We're going to have a special offer of some kind. As soon as you do that, it's like, hey, just because it's New Year or whatever, some, some big, you, you got to come up with a big reason. And it's going to be like 30% off. It's going to be bigger than your usual best discount. Then you get all the people sitting on the fence all come piling in and you have a big sales day. So when you do a very specific, when you do a, a very specific promotion, it may be a conversion sequence after someone signs up or it's maybe a 30% uh, off for the next four days only. And you have a series of four emails over those four days. It's a particular promotion. That's where you make the sales with the emails in between. I still send them. And I still have, oh, by the way, you can buy here. But the purpose of those emails actually is not to close sales, it's to build relationships, to build trust, to remain engaged so that when I do come back at you with a special offer, you are, you're ready and primed to buy. But it's kind of weird. I wish people would just act more logically and like just buy when they think, hey, this is cool. But they don't. And, and I don't, and we don't. It's like one of the weirdest things, even in conversational copywriting, old stuff like sale, discount, save, uh, it, it matters. It matters a huge amount. And, and it drives me nuts in a sense, but I know that's the way it is. So if you want to actually drive sales, you got to do some special event, some special discount, or including something extra, some bonus, something to make right. them think, oh, wow, this is better than before. I'll, I'll, make the, I'll dive in now. Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask a related uh, question, follow-up to Chris? Go ahead. Chris, is there a mechanism in L and Lifter uh, to offer a discount? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a whole coupon system in, uh, in there where you can set uh, coupons, you can limit the quantity, you can have it be global or have it apply to a specific course. There's, there's a whole coupon engine in there, so you can create a coupon in advance and then just add that to your campaign when it's time to, uh, if you're going to automate the giving of the coupon or you're going to do a broadcast and give it out, you know, to everybody all at once. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys. Yeah, you bet. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, all right. And I moved you back down, Joseph. Thanks for the great question. Um, I do, by the way, I'm still working. Copywriting is something that I'm always trying to do better at and know I have a lot of room for improvement. But to what Nick was saying, I like to, um, in terms of only asking for one thing at a time, like keeping that tweet simple, uh, I try really, I have to actually work pretty hard not to put, try to cram too much stuff into one email. So if it's a con, if it's like really a value piece and like part of the lead magnet, you know, I find some, you know, I just try to keep it simple and not have like two, three, four different angles going on. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive. Sometimes we think, hey, if I give them the 10 reasons or if I have a list of six, you know, six benefits or the more I put in, the more persuasive I'll be. It, it actually doesn't work that way. Um, so the simpler approach of like sticking to one thing will always beat out the, the multiple list of, of benefits and messages. Yeah, that's that is awesome. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and draw the winners. Um, Kathy's drawn them. I'm actually catching them on the side here uh, through our random system. And uh, after this is over, this will be available uh, to watch again. I'd recommend you doing that and, uh, you know, making a list of things to take action on because there's so many gems dropped today. But the first winner, which is a free copy of Nick's course. Wow. Okay. Don Wilson. Congratulations, Don. Um, so send an email to team at lifterlms.com and you will, uh, we'll get that set up or connect you with Nick. So that, Actually, yeah, look, yeah. Don, even better. Just write to me. I got you down, Don Wilson. Write to me at nick at conversationalcopywriting.com. I'm going to set you up an account I'm going to send you your login information. You're going to go in there. You probably want to change your 
password and that's it. We'll get you, I'll get you set up in the next 12 hours. Perfect. He's pumped. He says, thank you in the chat. Um, we have three more giveaway items. Uh, the next is a $99 add on from lifter LMS. If you decide you want something bigger than one of the $99 add ons, like one of the bundles, you can apply that as a discount. If you're already a customer, that's okay. We, we can extend your license out the value of $99. The winner of that is Rahul Narayan. Congratulations, Rahul. Um, go ahead and email team at lifterlms.com and we will hook you up. Hey, this is great. Do you, do you always do this? Do you always do these big giveaways? At these? Lately, lately. <laughs> this is great. I love this. Um, the next is actually came from a conversation in, uh, from the Lifter LMS Facebook group. Uh, I have conversations there a lot. I've really invested that as a way to get to know the Lifter people and people interested in creating courses. Uh, lots of people actually hit me up through the private messenger thing there too. And I talk to them there. I have lots of conversations. Um, so one of our community members, Garrick, um, for different reasons, he's not doing his course anymore, but he actually wanted to donate. He has nine months left on um, two Lifter LMS products that he wanted us to give away to somebody in the community here. So we're going to do that. And the first one is actually nine months of the Lifter LMS Universe Bundle. So the full retail year of that is $299. So a little, so nine months of that. Uh, thank you to Garrick. It is very generous of you to uh, come up with that idea and, and think about the greater Lifter LMS community. Uh, the winner of that is Tonya Pug. Congratulations, Tonya. Excellent. Um, and then the fourth is the uh he also had garrick had the advanced quizzes add-on so that's a 199 dollars add-on nine months left on that the winner of that is nelly vanderwerf congratulations nelly um so all you winners out there don get in touch with nick uh rahul tonya nelly Contact us at team at lifterlms.com. We'll get you set up and get all that worked out. Um, yeah, so that is it for the, uh, the giveaways there. Uh, so just to kind of close it all out, we will send a replay and uh, I'd encourage you to check it out. And if you're just now watching this on the replay, go check out Nick at conversationalcopywriting.com. I would recommend checking out his lead magnet. And if you're interested in his course, uh, if you're watching on the replay, there'll be a button below this video that you can click and it'll give you 20% off. It's not a uh, coupon code. It's like a link that applies to discount. Is that right, Nick? Yep. Yeah. yeah, you automatically, that, that whole, go to that page and you automatically get 20% off. That's awesome. Um, like I said, in the beginning of this call, uh, when I look back and reflect, I have a background in anthropology and, you know, outdoor tourism. I became a, uh, a, a decent marketer by studying copywriting and it's learning from people like Nick and really getting into the nuances and the psychology. I love how you brought the neuroscience into that um, <laughs> and elevating the conversation above the old pushy, you know, ways, you know, broadcast mediums. There's like a whole new way of doing things. And like Nick yeah. said, or whoever said, uh, what was it? All the world changes slowly. And then all at once. What is yeah. That? I that? I can't, yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> so so the, there's a new, there's a new era here of, you know, yeah. the future of selling online. That is an ambitious, uh, tagline, but I believe in it and I see it working, you know, just yeah. like, uh, just the conversations we're having here, and what seems to be working in terms of sales and what me as a customer, you as a customer or potential prospect want. You want to talk to somebody, you want a conversation, you want to feel heard. Um, it's a dialogue. It's not yeah. just- you want, to be, you want to be respected. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, Nick, um, thank you for the amazing presentation. Thank you for sharing all your experience and, and uh, not just coming with ideas with a bunch of actionable tips. We really appreciate that. Is there anything else you want to leave the people with? 
No, well, other than a, a bit of gratitude, I really, I really appreciate the fact that people took the time to, to stop by and listen. And I'm always really happy to share this stuff and uh, really grateful to you, Chris, for inviting me over. It's fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Kathy, for keeping the wheels on the bus here. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming. If you're watching the replay, uh, check out the links around that. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.